Hey everyone, I'm Chris and welcome to The Office Field Guide. I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever and today we're looking at the trivia episode in season eight of The Office. Good luck. We have a little bit of everything in this one. We've got trivia jokes. Everyone gets a point for Albert Einstein. Woo! Except for the Einsteins. We've got Florida jokes. Alligators are dinosaurs, Dwight. You know that, right? Mm, it's complicated. And we've got jokes inside of jokes. Now it does remind me that I used to do office trivia in the introductions for all my field guides. So let's do one for old time's sake. What is Gabe's alma mater? Eagle Eye viewers might even be able to find it in this field guide. With that, let's go. I understand nothing. Kicking us off in what must have been the inspiration for John Krasinski's The Quiet Place is the silent, cold opening. As Jim explains, the staff has been silent now for 14 minutes straight. This is kind of a bold thing to do for a cold opening, as the normal thing for network television is... Thank God! Wait, 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 down! So having near silence for well over a minute to kick off an episode was definitely unique. And it's hard to tell if this started off as a game. At least it seems to be that way because Jim starts coaching everyone afterwards. I think we can beat 20 minutes though, so let's try again. But it feels a lot more like when I would tell the kids let's play a quiet game in the car. But as time continues, more and more distractions arise. Dwight's tempted to make a sale. Andy's tempted by a garbage panda. And Kevin's just tempted by how amazing this Babe Ruth is. Oh, yeah. Oh. Silence is broken, and Jim suggests that everyone gets out everything that they wanted to say. And uh, Andy talks about the raccoon. Dwight says that Jim needs to stop tapping his pen, which Jim takes very well. It's going to drive me insane. Okay, just kind of reigniting that frenemy status. Aaron reveals a major gash she's kept silent about. Daryl sings a song about, I'm going to love you downstairs tonight. And then everything becomes inaudible. I'll say that the silence of this episode feels weighty against how we saw The Office earlier in the season in the incentive episode. This feels very much on purpose, as when we come back from commercial break, there's a conference room meeting in which Andy's attempting to poorly hawk off some paper to the staff, saying that they only need to come up with a deficit of like $800 to meet the goals that Robert California set for the branch. Last quarter, we saw 4% growth. Double it. You got it. Double. Done. I'm not kidding. Neither am I. It's already done. Double. So in the incentive episode, perhaps Andy's goal for the tattoo was not enough to meet Robert's goals, which I don't know if that's a continuity error or just a layer joke about Andy's ineptitude as a manager, but it definitely feels like the silence is being juxtaposed to the craziness. And if for nothing else, it's a reminder that keeping this pace in the workplace is just probably not sustainable. So Andy's getting outside the box here, first buying thousands of dollars of his own supply and now attempting to get the staff to purchase some, giving us both a fantastic callback, intentionally or not, to Dunder Mifflin Infinity. But you get to put the paper in this little shopping cart and then it says, thanks for shopping with Dunder Mifflin. Damn it, Kelly, it knows! It knows what you did! Would have been great to see Ryan react a little bit here. Infinity. There is an infinity of things that you can do with paper. But also the whole thing reminds me of the fan theory that the dot crew was keeping the branch alive by purchasing paper anonymously. I'm not sure that fits in anywhere here, but I just, it, it's where my brain goes. From this conference room scene, it's possible that Jim keeps a seat saved for Pam, who's still on maternity leave. But looking around the room, we do see that Dwight's mysteriously missing. Cut to the B plot. Animals, machines, vast virtual armies. All of these things I have successfully managed. The only thing I haven't managed, people. Dwight's flown down to Tallahassee to claim a new corporate middle management position for himself. Outside Robert's office, Dwight finds this NPC receptionist that bewilders him and Gabe Lewis himself. Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm up there. Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, I'm down here. I can think of no better way to confront my deathly fear of flying. Now Gabe's desk feels very makeshift. He seems very uncomfortable here, and it seems like it was just propped up there recently, like a desk doesn't really go there. He does have a sweet Medal of Honor there on his desk. I wonder if that's gonna come up in some way. No, Robert recognizes Dwight's assertiveness, 
but he takes every step possible to try to avoid having to tell Dwight no about the job. I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to meet with you. But I can give you this no, pitch in one minute. He's going to meet with you later. No, no, no. I, 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 I don't want you to rush it. This Saber office, by the way, is so 90s and so Florida. It's like Joe Bennett meeting the Golden Girls. While Dwight's getting flushed for Robert. Flush. Andy's trying to avoid getting flushed himself, so he asks Oscar to cook the books. My dad says an accountant can really help you out if they're willing to play ball. Those were his words. Gosh, Andy. Which might serve as foreshadowing for some of the financial problems we're gonna see in the future with Mr. Nardog. His dad blew through all their money and took off to Argentina with a younger woman. Now Oscar declines the invite to break the law because he says he has trivia that night. And the grand prize is well over what Andy needs to save face with Bobby. So he recruits Jim and Daryl to go work out trivia. And somewhere along the way, he picks up Ryan as well. Actually, somewhere along the way, he picks up everybody because they all show up at this gay bar's trivia apocalypse. Now, it is interesting that it's a gay bar, but I don't know if there's any deeper subtext in this episode. I'm willing to try anything. Not that anything. Okay, maybe there is, I don't really know. For the most part, I think the gay aspect of the trivia night, it just allows for some fun puns with the team names and then Andy gets razzed for a very flamboyant celebration. Go on Sorry, down. dial it back, this is a tail feathers. Ah. Ah. His trivia sequence is well-written, subverting expectations by having Actually's team face off against the Einsteins. Actually? who, while it was a team effort, the last two questions are answered by Kevin Malone, calling us back to this moment earlier in the episode. I know that making errors sounds like your kind of thing, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that. I really need a real accountant on this. Back in Tallahassee, Dwight's commandeered Gabe, and they've arrived at Robert California's condo, in which the CEO is practicing wrestling with a personal trainer. And Dwight seems to have a lot of questions about this. Nevertheless, Robert attempts to let Dwight down easy once again, and then rummages around his end table for a prized family heirloom, which looks awfully a lot like the one on Gabe's desk. Dwight at first looks like he's going to take the bait, but he's no beta, so he doubles down on wanting this job. It's a job interview, not a flea market. At this point, Robert simply explains that the job is not right for Dwight, and he'll keep him in mind when something else comes up. Again, foreshadowing something looming on the horizon. The stinger of this episode sees the Einsteins making it to the championship round to see if their performance was a fluke or not. A fluke is one of the most common fish in the sea. So if you go fishing for a fluke, you just might catch one. Spoiler, it was a fluke. The president of the United States is POTUS. Which is a fantastic and layered joke, and it just may be the key to understanding the deeper meanings. So let's dive into it. What does a bean mean? Someone please explain it to Kat. Okay, so I love this joke, and at the risk of ruining it by explaining it, I'm gonna explain it. It works so well and it pertains to the deeper meaning. So the word fluke has several meanings in English and even some of those meanings mean the opposite of other meanings. Fluke, for example, can be the little triangle things on the ship anchors that catch the ground underwater, which are designed like the flukes of a whale tail. Flukes are also these parasitic little flatworms, which I'm gonna spare anyone from seeing the visual of because screw that noise. But the definition I was most familiar with is an unlikely chance occurrence, right? Which is like a word you use in a situation in which something good or bad happens, but it was unexpected or maybe undeserved. In business, I hear it the most as a way to deal with someone else's success. If someone had something really good go for them, they just made like a string of good decisions, maybe the right place at the right time kind of thing. It's not that everyone else didn't put in the work. It's just that it worked out for that person. But I also hear it in the reverse. When someone has something bad happen, we also explain that as a fluke, especially in the sports context. A bad play for my team can end up changing the score, which can end up changing the momentum, which can end up in a loss, all because of a fluke play. Most interesting for me when I was researching this episode is, and forgive me, I'm an idiot, 
is that a fluke actually is a kind of fish. It's common up in the Northeast. It's another word for what I can tell a certain kind of flounder. Flounder is both a kind of a fish. I know what a flounder is. Now that's not something I knew until I was researching for this episode. So this whole time, like this episode came out in 2012. Remember they said that that was the year the world was gonna end? Anyway, I've been watching this episode for over 10 years, thinking that Kevin won the trivia contest and then followed it up with getting something trivial wrong about a fish, which happened to be a joke about how, yes, in fact, it was a fluke, reinforcing that their victory was more of a happen chance, slum dunder millionaire kind of thing. Slum dunder millionaire. As opposed to being an accurate gauge of their trivia prowess. It was a fluke, which knowing that little piece of trivia about the fluke makes this joke just a little bit more nuanced and interesting. The thing about trivia is, it's trivial. Like being good at trivia demands a certain way of thinking. Like we all have neurons mapped to different things in our brains. And I think we're all wired a little differently. Now I've done deep dives on every episode of The Office up until the episode we're on right now. And I've watched every one of those episodes several times. I've researched them, the backstories. I've read books. I've attended cons. I've watched interviews. I have wrote and rewrote scripts for field guides over the last three and a half years. You would think that I would be good at office trivia. I am not. My brain does not work like that. I need a good office reference at the right time. I'm your guy. Hey but need me to do good at office trivia? Literally the moment you ask me a question, I'm like, well, <laughs> no idea. Thing is in our current age, trivial things like this don't matter. Like not 100% saying they shouldn't matter, just assessing our current situation, they don't matter. If we have a computer sitting on our desk and computers in our pockets and digital assistants in our walls and in our cars and the entire collection of human knowledge is digitized, grafted, categorized, and available to everyone. Why should I devote any brain cells to knowing trivial things? Which is the deeper meaning. Andy's devoting so much to something that's so trivial. This is a rounding error. He's desperate over something so small. Dwight, on the other hand, stands up to Robert California's attempt to distract him with something trivial, to give something to Dwight that's essentially meaningless, along with a story that's clearly rehearsed. And for me, I think the message here is don't get bogged down with the trivial when your special project is waiting right down the road for you. But with that, let's write this thing. This is the worst. <laughs> Hey everybody, do all that YouTube crap. It definitely helps me out. Cost you nothing but a click or a tap, but it means everything to me. Okay, the cold open. So in its subversion from the norms for primetime television, the cold opening is attention grabbing. Even in the streaming age, if you're watching The Office in the background, you'll notice that full minute of silence and wonder if your TV started judging you again. Either way, it draws attention through the silence. But even that's not 100% true. If you listen to this with some quality headphones, you'll notice the ambient sound of white noise playing at varying levels of intensity as the stress of the situation rises and falls. It's well-written, well-executed, and well-written. And, and, if you don't say, Oh, yeah. Every time you bite into a candy bar, then honestly, like, why are you even watching this? This cold opening gets a four out of five for me. Good luck, one. As for the episode, okay, this is a very jokey episode, as I alluded to in the introduction. The decision to split Dwight off into his own quest, I think works well. I like seeing Alpha Dwight bounced off this receptionist. Bottom line, I know the product. I get it. Well... You got my boat. Oh my God. Yeah. I love his never say die attitude and the resolution while undercut by his acceptance of, okay, I'll just find something right for you. It works. Honestly, there's a lot of energy and charisma between Rain Wilson and James Spader here. And I like what's happening. They haven't really improved on the Oreo, have they? No, thank you. And the trivia plotline is very interesting to sort through. 
There's a lot of good I can say about this and very little bad. This might be my favorite episode of the season, to be honest, but I'll have to admit it's a very jokey episode. There's not a lot of cringe here and the tension that people love to feel from the office. It's not really there. And in lieu of that, we get tons of setup and punchlines, lots of them. The problem is that the trivia scenes are well constructed and well written and the jokes, they work. Each question is an opportunity for humor. Yes, Sean Mary. That doesn't sound right. I want to say LaDamian Washington. Wrong for so many reasons. We get great character moments. Okay, then we're going to have to take it away. Cannot have my phone. I'm sorry. I, I want to be with my phone. And also... Princess Ding Dong, do not hit that bell. Flying the... jib. Flying jib is correct. <laughs> that right there is by far the most I've ever believed these two people might actually have a thing for each other. It's a great setup, it feels real, and the consequences of the moment surely like would loom for both of these people long after the gay bar closes. All up, I give trivia four out of five. No! If Steve Carell was in this episode, he's not by the way, some people have thought he was this guy for reasons I can't comprehend, it was a thing. If this episode existed in season five, six, or seven, I think that you could keep every single thing the same, but just put Steve Carell in for Helms and put Helms in the B team. And this episode bumps up to a high eight on IMDb rather than a mid to high seven that it is now. But that's all I have to say about trivia. Maybe I should do another trivia live stream soon. Those were a lot of fun. Leave a comment if you want me to do something like that. And join me next time when we cover pool party. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.